Following on uh, from Paul's talk about some of the ways to think about becoming or what it takes to become or whether you might believe you might become a $100 billion business, uh, I am going to have a conversation with Mathilde Collin, who is in the process of building one of those $100 billion businesses, and she's going to be able to tell us all about that um, and her company called Front. So, Mathilde, uh, what batch were you in at YC? Summer 14. Summer 14. Wow. Already four years ago. So, tell us about your, if you would, your journey to being the CEO of Front. Sure. Um, so, in just a few seconds. So, I think I've always uh, been wanting to start a company, but the main thing is I didn't feel confident enough to think that I would one day uh, build a company. Uh, so I was hearing all these people saying, oh yeah, I'll start a company, and I, I was like, I wish I could say that, but I just don't feel like I can do it. Um, so instead, what I did is, after I graduated, I joined a startup that was super small, doing a contract ma management software, and that's when I discovered the world of softwares. And there is something that went well during um, this first experience and something that didn't do well. So what went well is I became very passionate about software in general. And I just felt like the fact that you could build something in a few months that could change how people work and people spend so much time at work, I felt was super rewarding. So that's what went well. So, um, so the you didn't find... Uh, contract management sounds... Painfully boring. boring. Yeah, yeah, so it's but, super boring. But but what was cool about it was that it actually changed how right, so people I, did their yeah, daily so work. I, exactly. And so when I was talking to people, so I was in charge of launching a new product for them. And so when I was talking to people using the product and they were telling me how their day to day was much better because they were using the product, it made sense to me. And it's still one thing that drives me today. Uh, so that's what that's what was great. What wasn't great is the culture was terrible. And so I was very unhappy. And I also understood how much of a responsibility uh, you had as you know a founding team of a company to create an environment where people would be happy to, to come to work. So a year after I joined this company, I quit this company. Um, and can you, can you elaborate a little bit? What, what, what was it about the culture that, that was bad? Um, so I think the main thing is there was no transparency. And so then there is no trust. And then there is no engagement from employees. Hmm. So I can tell you more about how I've built the front. And I think what's unique about our culture. But one of the things is how transparent we are. And I don't believe that transparency is good in itself. And that's why you should be transparent. I believe that that's the m most efficient way I've found to create engagement at scale. So if you ask people at front, why are you happy to come to work? every day, they will tell you, I'm happy because I can see the impact of my work and that's what I care about. And how do you make sure that people see the impact of their work? You make sure that everything is transparent from where you want to go, how you'll go there, what are the goals that they need to achieve and how their work relate to these goals. It seems like there's something really fundamental there for the companies that are going to be successful. Paul talked about what it felt like at Google where everyone knew where they were going and everyone was passionate and everyone believed. And so you had this energy in the company. So I guess somehow it, this is about sharing a vision with the team and having them believe in it and at every step in the way, having them be able to see how that vision is being created. Yeah, so I think there are two things that are incredibly important to it as early as you all are. So one is the vision. Uh, and of course you should know where you're going and of course you don't know yet and that's totally fine. Like I didn't know uh, four years ago how big front would be and I still don't know today. Uh, but I think that will just evolve along the way. What you need to have is just what you deeply believe in. And so what I've always believed in is front should be a place where people come to work every day and are happy. And our customers should be happier because they use Front, either because you know the impact of their work is higher or because it's an email product, so they spend hours in the app every day. But that's what drove me. And so today our mission is work happier, and I make sure that I explain to people what it means for us. And I think it should be clear to everyone in your company 
and to you why you care so deeply about uh, about what you're doing. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be, you know, this huge idea because the truth is I didn't know what front would be, but I knew that I cared so much about it and people could relate to it. So that's one thing. Super important. Yet, I don't think that that's the most important thing. I think the most important thing is discipline. And I think that discipline is actually more important than having a grand vision. And my personal belief, and I, I am sure that not a lot of people agree with me, is one of the reasons why we've been successful so far is because we've been incredibly disciplined in many, many things. So for example, always having one focus and making sure that it's clear to the entire company. So in the early days, we wanted to make sure that we were making something that people wanted. And the way we would track that was, can we generate revenue? And so every single day, everyone in the company would know where our revenue was and the next day where it was and the next day, etc., for at least a year. And anything that we would work on was aimed at increasing that revenue. And I was sending daily emails that became weekly emails. Uh, there are still weekly emails telling everyone how we're doing against our core targets. And I think having this discipline of focusing on a few things and making sure that in every presentation you do, in every email you send, even to investors, to whatever you show that, will be one of the key to succeed. So um, let's back up before we um, sure. dig further into the sort of the unique culture and the uh, success you've had at front. You left the 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 um, the lousy startup, <laughs> the lousy company with a lousy culture, and somehow you ended up deciding you're going to start your own thing. How did how did that transpire? What 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 led you to start your company to find your co-founder Laurent and um, and get going with Front. Yeah, so I think I was very lucky for a few reasons. Um, so one is I met my co-founder. So the story of my co-founder and I is not that, you know, we were best friends or brothers and sisters or whatever. I actually met my co-founder three months before we started the company. And then we spent so much time together trying to go through every hard conversations that I could think about. Like, I don't know, what if I want to fire you? What if you want to fire me? What if you want to sell and I don't want to sell and blah, blah, blah. And, um, we were just aligned on most things, actually everything. So that's one thing that um, led me to start this company with him. Then we found Angel. So you knew you wanted to start a company. Yes. And so I knew I wanted to start a company. I quit the software company. I knew I wanted to start a company in the email space because I love softwares, but I was using email to get work done. I wasn't, I wasn't using contracts. And so I knew that. And I knew that I needed money to start a company because I had to uh, have a loan for my school. And so I couldn't start a company if I didn't find money. And so I was lucky enough to meet with um, an angel investor in Paris who committed to giving us money. So Front is the company. Sounds really risky though. You had college debt. Right. You had just left your job. Yeah. And I don't know if that's the biggest risk I took or when I moved here with all our employees and their family and they quit their jobs and sold their house. So I've taken many risks in my life. <laughs> right. Wow. So so you decided to jump in headlong. You had to get money. You got an angel investor. Yeah. You found Laurent. Yes, and the last thing that I think is incredibly important is I found someone that became my husband later on uh, who believed in me. And I think that it's so important to find someone, whether it's you know a mentor, a friend, or whoever, who can tell you that you can do it. And maybe you already know that you can do it, but at least for me, like these four things were equally important. I would have never started this company if someone was not telling me every day, you can do it. So you found your future husband and your co-founder, different people, by the way, <laughs> at about the same Although time. Although my husband works at Front. Although your husband does work. But you, you met them at the He didn't work at Front at the time. And you met them about the same time. No, no, I met my um, future husband a few years before. But he was the one telling me, uh, you, you can could, do it at that time. Yeah. So he was supportive of you quitting your job and jumping in headlong into the startup Yes, thing. and he did the same thing at the same time. Right. So... Uh, and how did you meet Laurent? So in Paris, we met in a startup studio called eFounders. We and it was it was love at first sight. Uh, <laughs> how how did the two of you decide who was going to be CEO? 
Oh, that was very easy. So basically, everything I love, he hates, and everything he loves, I hate. Um, so he's the CTO of Front. He loves building the product, but he doesn't like Talking doing what people. I'm doing yeah. right now. <laughs> he doesn't like managing as much. Uh, and I think that when I reflect back on Front, the thing that I've been most lucky with is my relationship with my co-founder because we have the most amazing relationship. And what I mean by that is not that we're super close in a sense that we would hang out together and like he's actually he's a friend but he is not like my best friend or my buddy but we have so much respect for one another and that's the thing that you need to optimize for it doesn't matter how well you get along you just need to be so impressed by whatever your other person or other persons are doing and you you had a uh, sort of a unique process to figure that out in the beginning you you sort of grilled each other until you were sh both sure that you were compatible. Right. Yeah. Um, so when you began as CEO, what can you talk a little bit about how you split up responsibilities and what the role of CEO was? There's a lot of people here who have similar questions as to what exactly they should be doing as CEO. How did you think about that from the beginning? Um, so, a few things. So, my role as uh, a CEO in the early days, um, I was basically doing everything but being an engineer because I wasn't an engineer. But so, I was the product manager, the recruiter. I was, for the longest time, the only marketing person for three years. I was the only sales rep. I was the only su support rep. I was the only customer success person. Um, and I guess my job was just to do the job of like what ultimately will become uh, our team. And that was really what my uh, goal was. So everything but building. You, yeah. You, that was you, right? Exactly. Uh, how has that changed over time? We talked a bit with Elad Gill about how the role of CEO evolves as a company gets much larger, but it changes a lot, even as you go from two people to five people to 10 people, right? True. So I think what's super important is I wasn't expecting to hire people to figure out things that I would have not figured out. So it wasn't like, oh, uh, I'm struggling with marketing. Like, I don't know to, how to generate leads, so I need to hire someone better than me. Uh, so the way I was thinking about it is there are a few things that I feel are scalable. So for example, we would have leads that would sign up to front, I would call them and I would be like, do you want to sign up to front? Here is what front does, what's your process? And when when I started to think that another person could do that and could do it better than me because the person would be more skilled, then that's when I hired people. And so at every step of the way, I hired people better than me, but once I had figured out what roughly their job would be. And the mistake I've done in the early days was I've not figured out something and I hope that, that someone will figure it out for me. The truth is, if with all the knowledge I have about the company, I can't figure out something, I think it's very uh, rare that someone would come and figure it out. So I, that's something that I learned in the early days. So, so you can't count on someone else to have the answers right. if you don't have them. Yeah, for sure. And still today, like even today, we are 110 people now. And I'm not hiring people to figure out things that I've not figured out because I think it's incredibly hard. I'm here to hire people that will scale what's kind of working. Um, so that's what happened. So I hired people that were better than me on things that I had figured out. And then once I had everyone, I hired head of functions. Um, and then my job now is to find the head of every function and to make them work together. So that's how my job is, has evolved. So it sounds like from the very beginning, though, hiring was was foremost uh, in your mind is, is yes. a key role for the CEO. So one funny thing is anytime, so I was in the summer 14 batch, and so every week we had a speaker, and every time the speaker was talking about hiring, that's the moment I was on my phone, because I was like, you know, I don't care, hiring is a long time from now on. And that's probably a big mistake I've done because then you understand that hiring is the key. If you fail on that, your company will fail. So you should listen and just take notes and read the notes later on. So at least I can tell you um, one piece of advice that I got from Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe, um, that I thought was super insightful. So he said, in the early days, every time you hire someone, just think about whether you want 10 times this person. Because the truth is, this person will hire people like them. So I'm interviewing you, and I'm like, do I want 10 Jeff in this team? If the, uh, yeah, tough. <laughs> so if the answer is Maybe yes. No. <laughs> 
maybe I do. Uh, so if the answer is yes, then you know I can hire you. If the answer is no, but the bar should be as high as that. And I think that was a good piece of advice that I received. From the very beginning, uh, it seems like Front has a strong, specific culture. Uh, yes. Did, did you pay attention to that as you were hiring from the beginning? And, and how, did you how did you implement that? How did you think about it? Yeah, so I think very early on, um, I was very deliberate about what we call today our values, but I basically know uh, who I think I would work well with and who I wouldn't work well with, and that's the truth. Like, our values are just extensions of who we are as co-founders. And so, you know, some of our values are low ego and high standards, care and collabor collaboration. Uh, and the last one is transparency. And I, I just believe that I'm incredibly demanding and that's why high standards is part of our value. And I don't want to hire anyone that doesn't have these standards. I'm also, I think, very low ego. Like it doesn't mean I don't have an ego, but when I make a decision, I think about front first and I think about our employees first and I think about myself after. And I think that just putting words on what we care about as co-founders and then making sure that you're you're assessing that during your interview process is what matters. It doesn't, it's not useful to display them on a wall and to r explain them and all of that in the early days, but at least being just self-aware is what will help you um, hire the right people. And it, it does kind of speak to the fact that you are going to play an important role in hiring everybody in the beginning. Yeah, There's and I, I kept interviewing everyone till like employee number 80 or something. Did you ever find yourself in a position of of needing or wanting or having to compromise on those values or did the values always take precedent? Like there's, there was someone who maybe didn't quite match the values but was like the perfect fit for the designer job. So no, we never, um, so, or if we did, then we let go the person after, which is worse. Never worked. Yeah, never worked. And I think it's incredibly important in a company that's fast growing, like you think, for example, I've been willing to hire a head of finance for, I don't know, six months. And it's so important. Like we don't have any finance person at front. And we, I don't know, we are 110 people. We've raised 80 million. And I'm, I don't know what I'm doing because I've never done any finance work before. But I've never found someone that I was incredibly excited about that had both the skills and would match our values. So I'm not hiring anyone. And I think being very disciplined about not hiring, even if you desperately need this person, is important. I want to move on to product, but before we do that, I'm just wondering if if you were going to talk to relatively new startup founders or people with young companies like most of the companies in startup school, is there specific advice you'd give about creating a, a culture of success, the, creating the kind of culture you have at front for them? Um, so... I think my biggest advice would be um, one, to be incredibly de demanding. So I just feel like in the early days, if you have someone that's not working out, being very tough and letting this person go, uh, I think that's a mistake I've seen because, you know, if you have a team of five and one person is not working out and you kind of know and you always know and you're not making this tough decision that it has an impact on your entire team, it's easy to say, hard to do, and I can tell you how we've done it. Um, I think that's super important. I think transparency is just so important in the early days and even if uh, even at scale, but so making sure that everyone in your company knows everything, like there is no reason why you should hide anything, maybe except for, I don't know, salaries. Not yeah, so I was going to ask, where, when you say transparency, people throw that word out a yeah. lot. How do you, what, what in, in actual practice, what does that mean for you at front? Uh, so it means that everyone knows what I, com so a few things. One, I think there is bad transparency and good transparency. Good transparency is everything that you can share that will help people uh, do their job better and help answer questions they have. Bad transparency will raise more questions and create more problems than um, you need. And so, for example, like sharing salaries, like we can have a debate about that, but I think it raises more questions than it actually solve answer, uh, solve problems. Uh, but then f everything else. So everyone knows our revenue, our churn, every email about, I don't know, leads coming in and telling us what they want, customer complaining about this or being happy about that. Every NPS score that is here, either people are super happy, super upset, everything is public, our runway, the amount of cash we have on the bank account, every board meeting that we do, we publish the board deck, then I do an all hands and I share 
what the board said in or I answer question on the board deck, every I don't know, I share just everything that's uh business related. And also how I feel. Like I'm happy to say I'm ex extremely happy about that and I'm extremely unhappy about that. And every and everyone in the company ends up knowing that. And they know that and I think it's good because then if you really want people to work on the thing that are broken, there is no point in hiding what's broken. And there is always this I, this human feeling of I will not share because you know they will be uh worried. I'm going to tell them that that's broken. Uh, and some people joined two days ago and they're going to know that it's broken, but that's fine because, uh, what you gain is the fact that they will all work on that problem and that's better than avoiding the question. And it feels like people stay aligned and moving in the same direction. Yes. And I mean, you know that, but I think Fronty is like at least one thing, there are lots of things that, you know, we struggle with, but one thing that we've done, I think really well is our retention of employees. So people are super happy. Our NPS is, 87s, which is super high. Uh, if you look at Glassdoor, we only have five stars reviews. If you look at our attrition, um, no one has, there are just two people that have left front ever, and it was one to go back to school, one to join the company of their best friend. Um, so I think we've done a good job, and I believe that we've done a good job because of this engagement that we've created, thanks to this transparency. We, we, we were talking earlier about one great sign for a company, their for a company's product is having really high retention. But likewise, I guess, having really high retention of your employees is a pretty fantastic sign for a company. Yeah, and it's so important because so much knowledge is um, gathered. Institutional, yeah. right. And you lo every time, you especially if you lose someone good, you lose... So much knowledge. So much. So uh, you guys are a really interesting case uh, because you're uh, an enterprise company that started with a handful of customers... Well, zero, yeah. <laughs> eventually a handful, and then you've scaled to thousands. Can you talk about the early days of figuring out the, that you had product market fit and then, and then a little bit about the, the evolution to, you know, going from, you know, we were just talking about 10 or 100 people who love you to, to many more. Yeah. So I, I would say a few, a few things. So first thing is, I remember when I arrived here in YC for, uh, four years ago, uh, Kevin Hale was, came to me and was like, what's your company? And so I was like, it's front. And then it was like, Oh, so cool. I think it's one of the coolest company from this batch. And then I was sure that he was talking about another company. So, so, <laughs> and it's true. Like, I just was so. You mean he was confused about, oh, you must be, yeah, you must right. be confusing me with yeah. another company yeah. in the back. It's, it's just like, I wasn't confident. And another example is my batch mates would come to me and say, uh, should we use your product? And I was like, no, no, use our competitor. It's much better. It's true. Like, I just, I've always been very ashamed with the current state of the product. Uh, and, so and so, of course, convinced that we didn't have product market fit. Um, Isn't that one of the one of the definitions of product market fit? Is a product that your customers love, but that you're ashamed of? Uh, <laughs> maybe I think it's actually a good thing that you're ashamed of your product. But um, so uh, product market fit. At least I can tell you that if you feel like you don't have product market fit, great. Uh, doesn't mean that you're doomed. Uh, but then I think that there is a lot of things that we, I, I'm also someone that's like incredibly honest with myself and I can't, um, just wake up and think that I don't have product market fit. So I, I need to fix every single problem that I have. So how did I do that? One is, um, I've been incredibly, uh, disciplined about talking to as many users as possible. So my day to day at YC four years ago, and I can tell you what my day to day is today, but it's not very different. I was talking to leads and customers all the time. And I made sure that every single day I had at least, I don't know, seven, eight meetings with people that sign up to our product, even if they ended up not using our product, doesn't matter. I want to talk to them and I want to understand why they got initially interested. Can, can I just stop you there? It, it, do you remember, th th this might be a stretch, but do you remember any specific conversations that maybe changed the trajectory yeah. or at least changed the product so, uh, in, in significant ways? Yeah. And I actually in YC, so we started with this email that was helping companies manage shared inboxes. So shared email addresses like support at sales at, and that's what it was doing. And then we talked to, um, Adora, the CEO of Homejoy, and YC partner now. YC partner now. YC startup school 
Awesome. Um, and so she told me, oh, so the product that you've built, it's awesome. Could it work with SMS? Because uh, they were chatting through SMS with all their cleaners. And then we looked at Twilio and their API was pretty good. And so we realized that in a week we could just add SMS as a new channel. And, um, and it drove so much revenue because I think there was a big need for collaboration around SMS. And I would have never thought about it. I've never worked in a company that used SMS to work. Um, but, and so that's one example, but I have many more. I basically have never, like, I've worked one year in a company. So what do I know about business workflows? And still today, the reason why I still spend a ton of time talking to either leads or customers is because we're going, um, up market. We're going in new, uh, kinds of companies and new use cases. And one of the use cases that Trent is super, uh, popular in is logistics and transportation. And so I'm going to these tracking conferences and trying to understand what do I know about their workflows? Nothing. I bet like, you stand out at a trucking conference. Right. Um, I do. Um, so if I don't talk to them, then I can't lead the company in the right way because I can't hire the right people, make the right product decisions. And uh, so I just believe that that's what I used to do. That's what I still do. I think it's insanely important. And the only way you'll manage to do that is... By hustling. Like the truth is when you're early and you need to have eight meetings a day, it's insanely difficult. And so you need to do everything you can from reaching out to all the people you know to finding new ways to writing content in the hope of someone reading and then ultimately signing up to your product. And that's what I did. And I think that's what made us grow quickly in the, in the early days. So when you entered YC, do you remember how many customers you had? So uh, one thing I remember is when I when I interviewed at YC, uh, we had 3,000 companies that had signed up to our product, but it was closed beta, so they were not using it yet. And then I was onboarding them one by one, and every time was the same thing. Great, but we don't want to use your product because you don't have XYZ or it doesn't, it doesn't work. So maybe out of the 3,000 companies, maybe one ended up using the product, but that's just how I built so much knowledge about what they wanted. And then I was telling Laurent, need to build that. We're one feature away. I promise. Just one feature. Just one feature away. I still say that today. <laughs> and when you left YC, how many customers did you have? So when we left YC, we had 5,000 MR. And so we had probably like 130 companies using the product. Which is pretty amazing. So do you recall what the retention was of those 130 companies? Yeah, so we hadn't had a single user churn. So basically the reason why I'm saying that is because every time someone joined the company at front, I show the video of Demo Day. So I know my Demo Day pitch by heart because I've <laughs> listened to it so many times. And so part of the pitch is we haven't had a single user churn. So, and that's good, right? Great. It doesn't mean though, so that's great. But what wasn't great is our conversion rate from, you know, trial to paid was terrible. Why was that? Uh, I mean, just because the product was very early and so didn't have a lot of the features that the market needed. So have you managed to shift that over time? Yeah. I mean, we've built more and more and so our conversion has increased. Uh, I, I want to talk about how you went from hundreds to thousands of customers, but a question that's come up a lot during startup school is like, how do you figure out how to price your product? Can you talk about the you know Front's pricing journey from wherever you started to and how how you started and to where you are now? Yeah, so we started with a freemium uh, model, so we had free or nine dollar per user per month. Uh, one thing I would say is just release your pricing as early as possible because there is. So first, you're always scared that you're not ready, uh, but you're ready, all of you, at least. The, the good thing is that will confront you to the market and that's what you need. Two is when you want to listen to some feedback, you should listen to feedback of people that are paying some money because otherwise you can be overwhelmed with feedback from people that will never pay for your product. So we had a freemium model. What we realized is even if we had a free product, I, I think at the end we maybe had 15% of our users on the free plan. So it was more a distraction. Like it's good to have a free plan if that's a way for you to get leads and then you convert these leads. Uh, but if it's just something where you end up having, you know, 15% of your users, it's not useful. So removed it, changed it into 9 and 19, consistently increased prices over time, maybe too much. Do you feel like you started too low? Yeah, and I think 999 Nine percent of people will tell you that they started to, so yeah. Right. We, it doesn't matter though, because you can increase price later. 
It's harder to increase than to decrease, I suppose. Yeah. True, but everyone does it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did you come up with those numbers? Was it sort of about 1999? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you can work as... So we're now for the first did time... Did you ask customers what they would pay? And mm -mm. No, no. No. I don't think they can... I, I don't think they can tell you. They... I just, so, I mean, of course you can look at your kind of competition and then make sure that you're not 10 times cheaper or 10 times more expensive. Uh, but then once you know that and you have a rent, just pick a number and go with just it. Just pick a number and yeah, go. Yeah, it's like in the scope of distraction that you can have in the early days, like thinking too much about the pricing is one of them. Just pick a price and sell the product and you'll see what people say. Um, I, I wanted to dig more into one other thing about sort of the initial stages uh, of, of growth and talking to customers. Is there any advice you would give? Because, you know, you just gave a, a really useful piece of advice, which is to talk to people who are paying yeah. <laughs> more than people who aren't. But what what advice can you give to people who are trying to extract useful feedback from customers? Yes. So, I mean, I think, first of all, you should understand that not everyone wants to share feedback in the same way. And so for us, we had different ways to get feedback. So one of them was talking to people. And so people that would accept to talk to me, I would talk to them and they would tell me, I like this, I don't like that. But another thing that we did was um, we were using Trello for product roadmap. And so we published our Trello uh, roadmap. And so if you even today, if you go on frontlab.com slash roadmap, you can see our roadmap. It's and public. It's public. It's always been public. I can talk about that, but you can vote for the thing that you want. And that's uh, one of the way we got a ton of feedback as well. So I just felt like some people, and then another thing that we did was every quarter, at the beginning of the quarter, I would email all our customers and I would say, working on the roadmap for this quarter, what do you want to see? And then they would reply. And so I, I think it was a good mix of people that want to spend a lot of time, people that, that want to spend some time, and people that just want to do one click. Uh, but in any way, you need to have this data. So that sounds like it's a little bit later in your evolution when you had Trello and you had a, had a roadmap. In the very beginning, when you were trying to figure out, you know, you talk to Adora and figure out SMS, uh, what, was, what, was, what was that like? How did you know if you were talking to a customer who was giving you useful feedback or basically wasting your time? Yeah, so, I mean, so I think once you talk to someone, you have to figure out uh, if you understand the person really well because they can tell you, I think I want that, and then you build it, and that's not what they want. So the best uh, way you can think about sales, so I would bet that most of you are not excited about doing a sales call. I mean, that's my guess. Uh, and it's normal because I, otherwise you would be doing sales in a company. And that was uh, how Not I me. felt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how I felt as well. So one thing that I would say is the way I thought about sales in the early days was I wanted to make sure I understood exactly what the workflows of people were, what their issue was, and then think afterwards, confront solve it. And I think that then it becomes pretty interesting. So today when I do a sales call or, or a sales meeting or a customer success meeting, like I'm not here to sell extra feature or to demo the product. Like I find that a bit boring, but what I'm here to do is understand exactly what their pain point is and what their workflows is. And then can I explain to them how that could be better with front? if it can be better with front. And so I guess there are two things that you need to focus on. One is being incredibly honest with yourself about whether front is a good solution for them. And even today, one of the things that I struggle the most with is telling our team, these are some use cases we want and these are some use cases we don't want. And being very deliberate about saying yes and no in the early days is insanely important. And you know that. The truth is, you know where you want this company to be and you don't know 100%, but at least you can tell if that's something you want or that's something you do, you want. Um, and then making sure that you were super curious when you were doing these sales calls and making sure that it was more about understanding something that someone is telling you more than demoing the product or uh, showing a, a list of features they probably don't care that much about. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to that because it seems to harken back to your idea of discipline. Basically, you're saying you have to say no to some customers because, because if you want to keep your churn down to zero and you sell the wrong person the wrong product, you're going to have churn. 
Right. And I think the churn is not the, the, I think the biggest danger. I think the biggest danger is you have a customer and then, you know, you care so much about growing your revenue. So then they're telling you, I want this. And so then you build this and I want that and you build that. And then you just pull your, you push your product in a direction that you don't want to go. And I think that's the biggest mistake. So let's talk a little bit about sales because you have a, I mean, you've had to, learn about enterprise sales all on your own, and you've had to build a sales force. Uh, t talk a little bit about what that's been like and what advice you would give to people who are probably just a, a couple of folks trying to figure out how to get their product into customers' hands. So I guess my advice based on a mistake I did was, first, you need to figure out there are different sales motions you can have. So for example, you can have a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach. So Top down, you sell to, I don't know, CIO, uh, and then they deploy the product. Bottom up is you demo the product to the end user, and because they tell you that it could be a great tool, then that's how they will buy. And I think that it's we try to do both, and we've struggled a lot. And first of all, I think you should know how you want to sell your product, because the people you will hire, the way you will sell your, like everything will be different if you're bottom up or uh, top down. So piece of advice number one. Now I can tell you that we started bottom up. So um, we had a lot of customers and it was like, it was a numbers game. So the only thing that I cared about was our reps should call every lead five times and should end up having 15 demos every week. And I don't care about how they make it happen, but I want to see that level of activity. And so, you know, every morning we would receive an email saying, here are all the calls that have been done and here are all the meetings that have been scheduled and that have been done. And I think that the input is far more important at this stage than the output because the truth is if they don't hit their, tar their target, first your target could be wrong and how could you know what your target should be when you are so early? Um, and two, maybe your product is an issue or maybe whatever, your pricing is an issue, you don't know that. So I've always felt like... If you look at the end number, it's actually pretty challenging and you might blame someone for not doing a good job whereas they're doing a really good job. Whereas if you look at just number of demos and calls they make and if you check that they're not saying stupid things, then they're probably doing a good job and you should be happy and learn from that. You, you said something to me uh, the other day about... about um, one of the key lessons you learned and you were kind of referring to it earlier about uh, about the importance of listening versus describing <laughs> your yeah. product? Yeah, so I, I think the tendency, like you're all super, uh, either you're ashamed or whatever, you want to show your product, and I think that's the temptation, and every person I talk to that showing me their uh, new company wants to show me the product the truth is like resist this temptation first try to ask me questions because then it's too late like when you've not showed your product that's the moment you can ask so much because people want to see what's new so they will answer a few questions and i i believe that you should spend a lot of time listening to this understanding and then showing you know, maybe 10% of your features and it doesn't matter, but not showing, like, not doing, like, if I do the full demo up front, like, you'll be pretty bored. Now, if I explain to you how, when I was in your seat using front, I think is one of the things that made us successful as the company, then, and I'm convinced, and I'm obviously super biased, but I'm convinced, then maybe you'll be more interested to hear. So I'm going to transition uh, a little bit before we go to Q&A. Uh, I, I don't know, I have a feeling that your fundraising experience was maybe, uh, uh, Unusual. Not representative, uh, maybe a little bit uh, too simple, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Were there any lessons from fundraising that, that you think are useful besides grow really fast and have a cool company because that helps. <laughs> right. So, I mean, yes, it's unusual. Every um, every time we've raised, we've raised in a week. I, I think if I think about why though, so I think it's unusual and that's not what you should expect. Now, the thing that we did well, again, like coming back to discipline, I've published all my series, uh, seed series A, series B deck. They're online. So you can look at them and you'll see that our metrics are pretty good. And it just like every single day, every single week, and every single month, I care about hitting our targets, and I will do everything it takes for us to hit our targets. 
And that's what's shown in these metrics. And at the end of the day, even if, of course, people were excited about the team we had, the market opportunity and whatever, like if you ask them why were they crazy about Front, it's because of our metrics. So, yeah, I, I just so feel grow. like... So grow, have good metrics. But the thing is, you can't, you can't imagine, like even if it seems obvious, uh, the two things I've seen that I know are wrong from founders, one is coming up with excuses. So I'm, you know, for example, I'm helping you as a company and you tell me I want our revenue to grow. And then, you know, the week after we meet and I'm like, what's your revenue? And you're like, I'm not focusing on that because we had to redo our homepage because the conversion, blah, blah, blah. And I don't care about your conversion. Like the only thing I care about is, but I think, you've convinced yourself that your website was more important. And that's something that I see all the time is just finding excuses for not growing. And I understand how hard it is to admit that you're not growing and that's an issue and you need to fix it. But if you don't admit it to yourself and to your team, then you will not grow, that's for sure. Hmm. One, the ultimate founder delusion. Yeah. And two is then bring discipline to force you to face the reality. And one way is to send this weekly email to your team, monthly email to your investors. Like it's, I've invested in a few companies since like, I don't know, in, in the past few years. And you can't imagine how I can tell you after two or three emails, so two or three months, which companies are going to be successful. And I don't know if I'm the only one to have that opinion or that insight, but I just feel like there are people that will send an email and then nothing for four months and then an email and then blah, blah. Or some people that will change the format every single month and there's some people that are incredibly disciplined about here are our KPIs and I will send it to you every month and that's also what I show to my team and that's how we have focus. So important. That's a great lesson. So uh, last thing I wanted to talk about was... Um, your, uh, your co-founder recently uh, got sick, and it, it caused the company to, to have to, you know, do a whole bunch of things and, and, and maybe change you to sort of relook at your priorities and what was important to you as a person, as a CEO, as a friend, as a co-founder, and as just a human being <laughs> in the company. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, about what that experience has been like. Sure. So, um, December 2016, so a year and a half ago, uh, my co-founder was diagnosed with a cancer and it was pretty bad. Um, and now he's fine. So all good, but it took 18 months. And I think the thing that I realized and that I would, you know, well, you're here and you're listening to how to build a company. Um, every single day you're working on your company. It's so important, but you should remember that like the most important thing is to be happy and healthy. And as much as you care about this company, it's just a job. And I can't, it's, it's annoying to have to go through these painful moments to realize it. But one thing that I do now is anytime, so there are many things that I've changed, um, personally and for the company, but at least anytime someone joined the company, I go through a presentation and I share like what is front, what I care about. And I will always tell them like first and foremost, be happy and healthy. And if front is not a place where you can be and be happy and healthy, you shouldn't be here. And you know, front is important, but life is far more important. And I think them knowing that that's how you think is insanely important. So just tell the people you love that you love them and spend time with your friends and go on vacation and all these things are equally important as price are more important than pricing your product in the right way and doing all these phone calls, etc. That's just what I've been asked to talk about. Um, the other thing is, one thing that changed my life is uh, meditation. So, and I'm also convinced that it would change the, the life of probably, I don't know, 95% of human beings. Um, so, you... I felt like, before I felt like I had a choice between caring so much about my company and so therefore being unhappy. Because if you care so much, even if your company is doing okay, there are so many things to worry about. So I cared so much, I was constantly upset. Like, I don't know, I'm worried this customer is churning, I'm worried this person is not working out, I'm worried, I don't know how we'll hit our goals for next uh, for next month, etc. And Or then sometimes I try to care less, but then the company wasn't doing as well. So I was like, either I care and I'm unhappy, or I don't care and I'm unhappy because the company is not doing well. So I'm doomed. And I think meditation was really good because so I meditate 10 minutes every morning, I wake up 
have a shower, meditate for 10 minutes using Headspace. And, the th and it's, it's really something that uh, doesn't have immediate benefits. So if you're waiting, like I don't feel better after I've meditated. It's just you have to think about it as a muscle that you're training. And what it does is really what it says, which is Headspace. So it's like I, can't, I could tell you if you want how... Uh, things are going at front right now, but there's so many things need to be figured out. And the truth is, I feel great. It's like, I know that I have a bunch of things to figure out, and I know that either I'm working on them or someone else is working on them. And so I care so much, but I have this headspace to not be overwhelmed by everything bad that's happening. And that by far has been the thing that had the biggest impact in my life. And I think my co-founder being sick is what led me to me being overwhelmed to the point where I was not sure that I could still run front. And so I had to act and meditation was one of the things I did. So try not to wait until you have something that awful happen in your, your life or someone you love or someone you're close to's life. Um, we're going to spend more time on the topic of how, how, to, how to stay a human being while you're doing a startup uh, tomorrow when Daniel Gross comes in. Uh, to give a talk. Uh, but with that, let's go to Q&A for a while. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the same question again about enterprise and how you take care of the security and privacy part of selling it to the enterprise. And uh, I understand that you want an enterprise customer that yeah. feels desperate about it. But like when you actually are at a point where you are dealing with that, like what is the best practice? How much is enough? Yeah. Do so, so the question is is uh, around uh, dealing with safety and security when you're trying to sell to enterprise customers and how soon can you get it in their hands, I think, things like that. Yes, and so even if uh, you know we didn't start as an enterprise sales, we are dealing with emails, so security was a big deal. So what I would say is it's never enough. The thing is you have to find the companies that are willing to take more risks because you have no choice. Like for us, of course, everyone wanted us to be suck to compliant and stuff. We're still not suck to compliant today. Um, but what we did, we did a lot of things from, you know, just a one pager that explain everything about why our business is secure to, um, very early on, Tesla started using our product and they wanted to make sure that they were using it for product feedback and they were, they wanted to make sure that their information was secure. And so we did, um, a few penetration tests. Like that doesn't cost a lot of money, but you know, then if you can say, okay, we had good results and you can show the results to other companies, then at least it unlocks some uh, potential leads. But the truth is, you also need to agree to not go after a few industries or just not go after a few customers because they always want more. But there are companies that will accept to have their emails deal with a company that's three months old, not, knows nothing about anything, have, you know, and they will because there are a few things that you can show them. Okay, you got the same answer twice, so hopefully that helps. Yes. <laughs> How did you define, why, why, why in the end did you choose a subscription-based model? Um, so I believe that people get more uh, benefit out of the product when they have more users. So that's the reason why. I also think that most of our most of the competition, so whether you're looking at help desk solutions or email products, they charge per user per month or per user per year. Um, so the combination of everyone does it, plus it seems in line with the benefit that people get is what led us to have a subscription model. Yes. Uh, what's the best way to notify your users that you're going to raise for the black price? What's the best way to notify your users you're going to raise prices? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think, so I was chatting with the president of Atlassian who, about that, and he gave me some good advice, which is uh, the temptation is to say, um, we're going to raise our price, but we'll do, th do that maybe in a year. And so you want to be nice, and so you, you, you give a lot of time. The problem is you actually make your um, customers angry twice because by then they had forgotten, and so then, bam, again. So it's almost as if you increased twice. Um, so one trick I've used, so there is no, like, just tell them and, uh, and then do it sooner than later. There is no good way to do it. One trick that I've used that I think is successful is for us, so we have monthly subscription and yearly subscription. And so you can tell them that if they switch to a yearly plan, they will lock their price for one more year, which is win-win. They pay less, you have 
the money up front. So at least that's one way to show that you care about them. Yes. How do you set the target for your first sales rep? Um, so randomly, so, so yeah. how do you set the target for the first salesperson you hire? So randomly, the truth is I didn't know because I was the only one doing the job. So there are a few uh, ratio you can hear off. So for example, they should bring between 3x and 6x the, uh, the, the, the amount of money they're paid. So then you have a range because the truth is if they bring less than what they're paid, probably not good. Uh, 10x, like probably not good either. Like you should hire more. Um, so once you have that, then building trust with your first rep saying, that's what I will incur against. I have no idea if it's the right thing, but let's reassess every month and then let's be realistic about what's feasible or not. Yes? Question about bouncing users. So if you have potential users who are bouncing for your website or whatever, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to reach them up, how to find them and how to reach them up? Oh, this is a hard question. So if users bounce, how can you find them? Yeah, there are a few technology that you can use, like Clearbit is one of them. Uh, but I mean, for, for us, we I care more about the people that sign up and end up n never converting because they should interest. The truth is, I think our conversion rate on our website, I don't know, is maybe 3%. So there is so much and we don't know about them. So we don't do much about them. Leaky funnels at the top are difficult. Yes. Yeah. How sorry? How early should you uh, put pricing out there and be transparent about it, even uh, even while you're still in beta? So it's a good question. One thing I did that I think was a great idea was so implementing Stripe for us took some time, and so but I wanted to know if people were willing to pay for the product before we had Stripe in implemented. So in private beta, when you sign up to France, you would receive an automated email from me saying. What would you give me to get access to to your to our product? And so then I don't know. So I like Legos, and that was on my Twitter feed. And so some people would send me uh, um, Legos, Lego sets, uh, or like one. Our first customer is a company called Lumio. They do a lamp, and so they said, "Well, I'll give you a lamp." And so I guess I was just very you know creative into trying to understand what people were willing to give. And if it's not money, it doesn't matter. The truth is, even giving an hour of their time, if you ask them, you can have access if you spend. 30 minutes an hour with me is a proof that they will accept to give something. In the back. How did you get your first 3,000 signups for private beta? How did you get those first 3,000 signups for private beta? So it was only content marketing. So I was uh, doing an email product and I was writing all these um, blog posts about uh, is email dead as Slack is saying or like all kinds of things that I think people were curious to hear about or what will email look like 20 years from now and content marketing was, or then I was at YC and I was uh, writing a, something about what it's like to be at YC a month in and then another one, what it's like to be at YC three months in and, and just people kept reading them and so content marketing has been big for us. I think it's good in the early days. I don't know if it scales as much. I don't think it does, uh, but that's how we got our uh, signups. Yes. So you talked about putting on more features based on kind of what you hear from the customers. Once you have a set pricing and they kind of understand that and then they ask for more features, how did you adjust your pricing after that? So how do you adjust pricing uh, in the context of, of feature demands or, or new product demands from customers? The truth is new features are always a great way to upsell. And so usually what I, like I was very happy to build a new feature and put it on a new plan and say, like, would you, you can have a 30 day trial of this feature, but then would you be down to double the price per user if you're using that feature? Also something that we did two years ago, um, and I wrote a blog post about this is we built, um, a, a backend system that enables us to iterate super quickly on our pricing. So if tomorrow I want to change one of our enterprise feature and put it in the premium plan, like I can easily do it and I can just release the new pricing, doesn't change anything for existing users. So that's a good way to just look at your cohorts and see where does every feature fit best. Okay, we're gonna do one more question right here. 
said you prefer to your job, you want to work in email. Uh, what, how did you figure out exactly what product to build? So the question is, you quit your job because you wanted to work in email, but how did you figure out what product to build? So I think email is a big problem to solve. And so we had to make sure that we had the right go-to-market, um, which was shared email addresses as a way to enter this market. Um, the reason is it was an easier product to build. Uh, people were willing to pay for it, and you could have a lightweight deployment within an organization. So not the entire company needs to use front. Um, the reason I chose that is I had a pain point uh, when I was uh, at this company. I remember that we had all these support at sales at addresses and people kept asking me, did you reply to this email? And I was like, yes. Do you want me to CC you on every single email? No. So just believe me that I replied to this email and that's a pain point I had seen. And so I thought it was a good, a good entry. Awesome. Thank you, Mathilde. Thank you so much.